background. I'm from, from Microsoft Research Cambridge in the UK. And the lab over there uh, was when founded in the 90s, uh, the first Microsoft lab outside of the US. And we're now more than 100 full-time researchers working in all areas of computer science, from operating systems, programming, programming languages, but also um, human-computer interaction, which is my personal background. Um, and I'm working in a relatively small group of just seven uh, full-time researchers called the Sensors and Devices Group. Um, and we're also working on a broad range of topics from ubiquitous computing, so sensing activities, sensing the environment, um, to human-computer interactions. And one interesting aspect of our group is its strong background uh, in hardware engineering. So we have a mantra uh, that hardware is not a given. So we actually build our own devices. And you're going to see like a few Surface-like devices um, that we've developed over the last couple of years. Um, and that means in practice that we have the full control over hardware, software, sensing all aspects that matter when humans interact with machines. Um, and that allows us to come up with um, devices and with applications that allow users to interact and see um, interactive graphics in novel ways. Um, and one particular area of research that I want to highlight today is interactive surface computing. Um, and I wasn't really familiar, uh, or I wasn't really sure how many of you were familiar with that term, um, but this morning I saw that we actually have a Microsoft Surface out there, so I think uh, most people actually know what, what interactive surface computing means. So I'll be very brief on this one. Um, so interactive surfaces are a novel class of, of computers, if you want so, that respond to hand gestures, to real-world objects, and they help uh, people interact with digital content in a simple yet intuitive way. Um, and this characteristic of this class of devices is often called or interpreted as natural interaction. And I'll come back to, to that term because it matters what we mean when we say natural interaction. Um, but one thing is, is pretty sure that these devices have a very physical quality and there's a certain enjoyable element to interacting with them. And I'd, I encourage you to go over there and play with the Microsoft Surface later on. Um, and another interesting aspect why these devices capture people's imagination is that they allow multiple users um, to, to interact and collaborate very naturally around these computers by simply um, touching digital information while maintaining eye contact and other important social cues. Okay, um, so let's have a quick look at um, what Microsoft Surface, the product team, uh, does. <laughs> The possibilities seem endless as the line between the virtual world and the physical world becomes increasingly thin. Turning friends on to new music will one day be done with the greatest of ease. And it will happen on a table that lets us share our photos with the flick of a wrist. phones will help us make plans for the evening. And then guide us on our way to the show. Okay, so this was obviously a promotional video, um, but it's interesting to take a closer look at the vision or at the interaction portrait in, in this video. It's, a, it's actually a couple of years old, but um, the the kind of interactions that you saw in this video are still very representative for what we see on similar devices, not only within Microsoft, but other research and product groups. Um, so let's have a look at some of these exciting interactions. What we've seen so far is using two fingers to stretch, zoom, and rotate photos. We've also seen stretching, zooming, and rotating of photos on smaller devices. We've seen the same thing on laptops and other interactive surfaces, and we've seen zooming and rotating a map. So maybe not as exciting as you know the promotional videos want to tell you, but there are actually very, very interesting application areas. 
Um, but the thing that I want to highlight here is the mismatch between the term natural interaction that's used in, in uh, when talking about interactive surfaces and what actual natural interaction looks like. So if I think natural, I don't think about stretching photos using two index fingers or maybe three or whatever. Um, when I think about natural interaction, I think of using like the full manual dexterity of human hands, something more like this. Manipulations that exploit are full manual dexterity, using multiple fingers, two hands at the same time, and it, um, interactions that resemble how we interact w would interact with a real-world object, and even using objects that we find in the environment. So there was a little red uh, envelope right there. Um, And also be aware how many different interactions are going on here. So we can coarsely push this ball around, we can spin it, we can use the flat hands, the side of our hands, um, and exert very fine-grained control, almost as if this was a real ball and not a virtual beach ball here. Um, so this looked uh, really easy, didn't it? Unfortunately, uh, we had to, to go through a little bit of trouble to make it look that and feel that easy. And I want to give you an idea about how this, how this works and um, what's necessary to enable these kinds of interactions. So we started out um, with looking at, at some of the existing tabletops interaction. As I said, they promise natural interaction, but because the interactions have been pre-programmed and designed a priori, they don't actually behave in a very natural way all the time. Um, and this means that interactions or uh, experiences can break down when people's intuitions and the software behavior don't match up. So if the idea, uh, if the designer's idea of what the user wants to do is different from what the user actually wants to do. Um, and in recent years, um, gaming physics engines have emerged and have become ubiquitous on consoles and PC games. Um, and they carry the promise to change the sit situation to the better bec because they allow very realistic and natural um, behavior of virtual objects. Um, and in fact, you've already seen a little preview of the interactions enabled by such simulation packages when combined with um, multi-touch or natural uh, full hand interactions. Um, and these simulation, uh, simulation packages control the behavior of virtual, uh, of virtual objects, mostly rigid bodies, by uh, using concepts such as mass, friction, uh, but also collision detection and response. Um, and the main issue that we're addressing in our research and in, in this particular pro uh, project is the combination of uh, the rich data that we can sense from interactive surfaces and these uh, very sophisticated physics simulations. Um, so in order to understand this issue a little better, we need to have a look at how interactive surface input is being sensed at the first place. And I'll try to explain um, the basic principles behind it. Um, so there are many different interactive surfaces out there. Microsoft Surface is just one product of many. And if you look into the research world, there's even a lot more. Um, and there's uh, also a variety of approaches to, to sensing user input, but a very popular appro approach is to, to apply cameras and computer vision algorithms to detect fingers, whole hands, um, but even tagged objects and other shapes or the outline of shapes. Um, and the trick here is to use infrared illumination and infrared sensing cameras to rep separate the things that we're interested in, uh, mainly our hands, um, from the projected image and other things in the background. Um, so this is a schematic of the Microsoft Surface or the inside of the Microsoft Surface. And there's four aspects that I want to talk about. First, and labeled with the number one, is the diffuser. And this serves as projection screen, so that's where you actually see the graphics, but also as touch sensor. Um, and then underneath the screen, uh, labeled with the, with the blue two here, is an infrared light source, usually an array of, of infrared LEDs, uh, essentially illuminate um, the, the objects in contact with the diffuser, so the cameras can see them, but because it's in the infrared light spectrum, this light source is invisible to the human eye. And then 
um, there's at least one camera, in the case of Microsoft Surface, there's several cameras to increase accuracy and precision um, that detect light that's being, sh that's being reflected from users' hands touching um, the projection screen. And last but not least, there is a projector that actually generates the, the computer graphics that you see. Um, and here you can see, oh, it's fairly dark, but you can, s can see an image from such a device. So this is what, what the cameras underneath the projection screen actually see. A user touches the surface and the infrared camera captures the re reflections from, from the user's skin. Um, and typically we're interested in the fingertips only um, so we're reducing this image, which is pretty much a full hand, um, to something that looks more like this. So we're seeing bright white areas where human skin is in touch with the projection screen. And then we're running an algorithm that's called connected component analysis, which essentially only reduces this to only one point per finger and um, tracks these fingers across several frames. Um, but what um, the problem with this approach is actually that we throw a lot of information um, that we have about the shape of the object in contact with the projection screen, and we take this information and essentially discard it, we throw it away. And if you look at, um, at the variety in human grasping and manipulation strategies, so here's just a few examples from the real world, um, and, and if you think about how all these different uh, depicted manipulations work, you would probably agree that reducing surface input to just fingertips or even um, the center of mass of fingertips is probably not a good idea when it comes to enabling natural interfaces. So in order to come closer to the ideal uh, natural interface, we need a way to model the rich human manipulation vocabulary within the physics simulation. And one of the key challenges here is to fully leverage the physics simulation to increase the realism and uh, na naturalness of the interactions, if you want so. Um, so what we didn't want to do was to re-implement a lot of different interaction techniques and, and behavior of virtual objects uh, that borrow from the real world in a metaphorical manner, but we really wanted to, do, to let the physics solver do all the work and have the objects um, resemble real, o real objects as much as possible so that users can leverage their knowledge from the real world and from, from interacting with the real world. And we explored quite a few techniques and I'll just brush over them, but I, I hope it gives you an idea which are the more promising ones. Um, so, in, so in order to enable users to interact with virtual objects, we need to find a way to map our input onto behavior of, of virtual objects. And there are different viable options um, to do this. And one of them is to, to look at the motion of fingers on the surface and map this to a force that's being applied to the virtual object directly. Something like, li like, like this little animation here. Um, and this is actually the most physics-friendly way. And this is how motion is modeled within, uh, in, in most games. Um, Let's have a look at a similar example, but now we introduce a different object into the motion pass. And what you want with, with uh, interactive surface interaction is full control over objects. So if you move a, an object on screen, you actually want the object to stay underneath your finger. So consider uh, you want to move the blue rectangle from point A to point B, and you move, move your finger across the screen. And as soon as it hits the other object, um, we have a problem here because there will be a collision response. Yeah? So something like this would probably happen. The object would spin out of its path and none of the two would end up in, in point B as we, as we want it to. So let's uh, rewind this a little bit and uh, think about what we had to do to, to keep uh, the blue object on its motion path. So essentially we had to, to add additional forces to counteract the collision response. And by now you probably understood that this is actually um, quite a complicated process that's going on. Unfortunately, there is a lot of forces that are hidden from the programmer and from us in the physics simulation at all time. Collision response is actually one, but there's also gravity, there's air resistance, there are friction forces. And in order to, um, to actually j accomplish this very simple task of moving one object from one point to another, 
we essentially had to implement a custom solver on top of the already very sophisticated physics solver. Um, so unfortunately, uh, that we're dealing with multi-touch input makes this even more complicated because several fingers or multiple fingers would mean multiple forces that are uh, potentially opposing in direction and make this whole situation very, very messy and difficult. Um, so the next model, the next approach, because calculating forces directly is actually a little bit too complicated, is called proxy objects. And the idea here is to introduce um, essentially representatives of your fingers into the 3D scene or into the, the physics simulation. And the approach starting with the user interaction w works something like this. So whenever we see an object in contact with the projection screen, um, we see a bright white spot. And then we are running a connected component analysis which returns the center of mass for each point of contact. And we um, ray cast into the scene and wherever uh, these rays intersect with the ground floor or virtual objects, we introduce these little red cubes that you see. And then as we move our fingers on the surface, we displace these cubes accordingly, which then collide with other objects and the physics solver essentially controls the behavior, position, uh, rotation, orientation of objects in the virtual scene. Um, the nice aspect uh, is that the physics solver does all the heavy work for us. We get like very, um, very sophisticated, almost realistic behavior of virtual objects, but we don't have to program any of that. Um, and we're actually interacting with virtual objects in a, in a way very similar to the real world by exerting collision and friction forces. The disadvantage is that the mod model doesn't actually take the shape of the surface contact into consideration. So as I said, for each contact, we're introducing one of these um, proxy objects. Um, so it doesn't matter if we touch the surface with a finger or with the full of our hand, it's always going to end up being one of those little red cubes. Um, and this actually doesn't play very well with uh, non-planar 3D objects. So an incrementation of this model um, is, is, or we calling this incrementation a uh, particle proxy model. The idea here is very similar. We're introducing objects that live in the physics simulation, let the physics solver do all the work. Um, but instead of looking for the center of mass or just a single point, we're actually taking the shape of contacts on the surface into consideration. Um, and then we're essentially walking like the contour of our hands in contact with the physics simulation and introduce one of these um, red, ro uh, red rods for every pixel on, on the outline. Um, and this solves two problems. First, uh, the collisions that we have um, accommodate the shape of the, or obey the shape of the contact with the projection screen much better. And they also model um, forces such as collision and friction much more accurately because we can actually, um, we can actually uh, conform to 3D shapes within the scene. Um, so this was all a little bit theoretic and I want to give you a practical example of how this, um, how this works and then we'll see some, some more interactive examples. So this is an actual user um, interacting with a 3D physics enabled scene. We see two hands one resting flat, the other one on the side. And there's also a, a coffee mug and a notebook. Um, and now let's have a look at the sensor data. This is what the camera actually sees after thresholding and running the edge detection. And again, you see the hand or the outline of the hand. Um, you also see like an imprint of the coffee cup and a notebook right here. And then the last step, in the last step of this example, we see a screenshot of the actual physics simulation. So down there are the objects that we want to interact with. And then you see the fingertips of the user's hands. Uh, this red wall here on the bottom left corner is the, uh, is the notebook and you can also see the round shape of the coffee cup. Um, and when we now move any of the objects in contact with the, uh, with the projection screen, we're actually moving these um, chopsticks, if you want, so through the scene and they then interact with, with other objects in the virtual scene. And this is a video of some of the interactions enabled by, by this model. 
that's playing. Yeah, so you can see um, the user's interacting with its fingertip, but also using the side of its hand. And now we'll see stopping of objects that are in flow. We, we're seeing interacting with two hands at a time, all 10 fingers, and even richer gestures, such as this raking, and then there's like cupping gestures. And all this wouldn't be possible if you, um, if you would think of objects as fingertips, right? Um, and this is uh, the same video from before. Um, and now we see uh, how many different interactions, Ooh, sorry, let me play that again. How many different interactions are going on here? And this wouldn't really be possible if you, if you try to pre-program all of these different uh, interactions, such as spinning, stopping, pushing the ball around. If you try to detect this with a gesture recognition approach, um, there would be just too many different, different possibilities. And the differences intera in interactions are also a little bit too subtle. Um, and then in this video, I want to highlight that our model is actually agnostic to what kind of objects we're interacting with. So we can exploit the capabilities of the physics simulation, not only use rigid bodies, but also soft bodies and simulate something paper or cloth-like that we can then use to, you know, to experiment and play around with, drape this, these cloth-like objects over rigid bodies. And with a little bit of practice, we can actually um, start folding paper-like objects in something that resembles almost virtual origami. Or we can play around um, with the parameters of, of these objects and, for example, make them terrible so we can just rip objects apart. And the model is not only agnostic to whether it is a hand or a physical object, so we can uh, uh, use this wooden block to anchor the springy cloth down so it actually stays in place when the, when the users let go. And finally, um, we can use really any kind of object that is infrared reflective, such as this uh, red envelope to, to rake multiple objects and, and move them all at the same time. All right, um, so I, I won't go into much more detail about this because I know that there is a lot of technical detail and um, I just want to um, wrap up this first part of the, uh, of the presentation today. So you've seen a new technique um, that brings physics to the surface while preserving much of the fidelity of, of manual dexterity and the fidelity of input that our, our hands allow us. Um, and there's, there's obviously like many optimizations and problems with this approach, but I want to highlight one aspect that we're going to talk about in more detail uh, further down the line. And this is uh, the, the mismatch of input and output. So we're still sensing 2D because it's a flat surface that we're interacting with, which can feel as if you're, um, you're poking objects protected by a, by a thin layer of transparent film and you're trying to, to grasp them really, but it's not possible because the sensed, sensed input is only 2D. And also, um, the projection is obviously 2D, so we can, we can only project onto one display and not you know, like 3D objects in space. Um, so the next part of this presentation, I want to talk about a new surface technology that addresses some of these limitations. Um, a tabletop technology that supports imaging and projection beyond the display. Um, so let's recall, um, and I, I, I talked about this earlier, how surface input is actually sensed. So this schematic approach um, shows a very typical tabletop approach. So underneath the projection screen, um, there is a infrared, uh, there's a camera uh, with an infrared pass filter and a projector and some sort of uh, infrared illumination scheme. Um, and if the diffuser up top is essential for both sensing and projection, but it limits what the camera can see beyond the display, obviously. So it's a blessing and it's a, it's a curse at the same time. Um, 
And this is again raw sensor data of such a device. And we can see that only objects that are actually in, in contact with the surface are visible to the camera and the entire background is clipped away. And this, um, as I said, is, is a blessing in one sense because it makes it easier to detect touch events and discriminate them from, from objects that are just on top of the table. Um, and it also enables us to project an Im image because the diffuser, you know, the diffuser scatters light. Um, but that um, makes it impossible to see through the diffuser and to project through the diffuser. Um, but in recent years, there is like an emerging, an emerging class of, of display materials, and in particular, I want to highlight one that's el an electronically switchable diffuser. So on the right hand side, uh, on the right hand side, you see um, a typical image from a camera underneath a static diffuser. But when you apply a voltage to this particular material, it actually changes its state from diffuse to clear and all of a sudden you can see the user's hand and you can s even see the, the floor underneath. So we can all of a sudden image through the display um, and, and detect objects at much, much further distances. Um, and now if we go back and forth, we can, uh, we can see that we can potentially, if we do this fast enough, actually project an image onto the screen and half of the time look through the display. Um, and what we get then is something like this. And this video we're switching slowly so that you can actually see it. But we get the same, this is very, very dark. Um, but we get the same kind of input that, we, that we're used to from normal tabletops. But once we switch the diffuser into its clear state, we can actually see objects um, very clearly and also further away from the display. Um, and then uh, let's have a look at the projection side of things. So we've seen that this change is sensing, but it also does some remarkable things to what we can do with images. So um, this is again, um, if you want so a regular rear projected screen, we're seeing a full size image um, on the screen and nothing above. Um, but as we switch the diffuser into its clear state, we see nothing on the main screen, but there's just a regular sheet of paper that reveals an image that's otherwise not visible. And now, if we start switching the diffuser really, really quickly, we can see two different images. And they're both coming from underneath the table, so there's no projector on top. Um, and there's only, there's only one self-contained setup, right? Um, and before I go into more detail, let's have a look at, at our hardware setup. So this is, a, this is a picture of the second like prototype. And at the heart of it is obviously the switchable diffuser. This is a liquid crystal material display, which goes diffuse clear, whether you apply voltage or not. Um, and in order to, to be able to sense direct touch interaction, there's a regular sheet of acrylic on top of it and we're using infrared illumination to shine uh, infrared light into this uh, surface. And we're exploiting a technique called frustrated total internal reflection. So normally the, the light is trapped in the acrylic and bounces um, unless a user is touching the, the acrylic sheet. And then um, the user causes a frustration of this total internal reflection so that light is being um, reflected off the user's finger and can then be captured by a camera that's underneath the table right there in the middle. Um, and this camera is synchronized to the switchable diffuser or to the diffuse state of the switchable diffuser so that we see bright white spots whenever an object touches the screen. Um, but if we want to image objects above the surface, we could also sync uh, this camera to the clear state. And then finally, uh, the setup contains two projectors augmented with liquid crystal shutters, so we can really quickly turn the projector on and off. Um, and these shutters allow us to control when an image is projected, so that one projector uh, displays an image during the opaque phase of the diffuser, which is what you see on the main display, and the other projector displays an image during the clear state, which normally just travels right through the display, but if you hold an object, into, um, into the path of light, you can reveal that image. 
Um, so when we're original, we're planning to give you a live demo, but unfortunately, a little uh, volcano on Iceland prevented uh, my colleague Dave Molino to fly over here and also prevented us from bringing the actual demo. Um, but fortunately, uh, Dave was able to record a little video of the live demo, and I'm going to play this. I'm David Molyneux, and I work in the Sensors and Devices Group in Microsoft in Cambridge. And I'm working on the Second Light prototype. This is a, a Surface computer. It's a multi-touch Surface computer, very similar to the Microsoft Surface, which is now a commercial product. So you can have one touch point, you can have multiple touch points for uh, more natural and intuitive gestures to actually interact with our, our data on the Surface. In this case, I have um, an image of the night sky. Now, if I had to ask most, most people what constellation this is, they wouldn't know. However, if I now place a piece of tracing paper over the actual display, what you can see is another layer of information which is revealed, which is completely separate to what's being shown underneath. In this case, we're revealing the name of the, the constellation and some of the names of the stars. Here I have a map of Cambridge. In this case, if you want to know what the roads are in, in Cambridge, in the city centre, we simply, again, move the piece of tracing paper over the display to reveal this hidden information. Okay, um, so this was just a really quick demonstration uh, what this technology is capable of. And all of a sudden, like totally passive, uh, very, very cheap objects such as tracing paper or frosted acrylic um, can be used as, as magic lenses to reveal hidden information um, on top of projecting a regular image onto, onto the normal projection screen. Um, and um, as I said before, we can not only make use of, of passive objects, such as tracing paper or, or acrylic, we can also use the camera mounted underneath to actually track objects. So in this video, we attached like two strips of reflective tape to this um, tracing paper, and then we can actually, we know the position of this screen and can project an image that moves with the, with the tracing paper. And in this case, we're just displaying uh, snippets of video on it. Um, and we went actually a bit further and augmented this, this sheet of acrylic with just a tiny little bit technology. So here again, we use LED strips to shine infrared light into the acrylic, which uh, again, mostly remains trapped within the acrylic, but you see at the bottom and at the top of the sheet of acrylic, there are two lines etched into the plastic. And from, from these lines, infrared light seeps out, which allows us to track the device from underneath. And the neat bit is that we know the lengths of these lines and the distance between the lines. So from the distortion in the camera image, we can actually calculate not only the position, but the full um, six degrees of freedom, so rotation in 3D. Um, and this allows us to, so this similar video, we see the walking man, but um, we not only move the, move the video in, two dimensions with the, with the movable projection screen, but we can also hold this at any kind of angle and there is no visual distortion of the image, which you usually get in a projection screen that you rotate out of the projection plane. And this actually works at pretty extreme angles here. Um, and because this is an edge-lit she sheet of acrylic, we can actually get multi-touch for free. So this is the, Im uh, the camera looking through the projection screen, and you see the two lines, but you also see when the user is touching the mobile projection screen, we get multi-touch on a, on a sheet of plastic that's, I don't know, a couple of pounds. Um, and if we, if we throw everything together, we get a mobile Oops. We get a mobile platform, um, but we get also multi-touch on the main display um, and on this portable platform for free. So just a battery, infrared lights, and then all the smarts remain within the tabletop setup. There's no camera overhead, there's no, no processing power in this mobile platform at all. Okay, and then the last uh, neat little trick that you can do with Second Light um, is to further exploit the fact that we can shine light through the projection screen. And here we're using um, 
acrylic prism objects to redirect light. So we're seeing the same on-surface interactions, but we can shine light onto the bottom of this prism object, and then uh, it'll re redirect the light so that we can actually see an image on the sides of it. And again, this is done by regular projectors, and no, no advanced computer graphics involved here. Um, so these are these are kind of the uh, the tricks that you can do once you can project through uh, an interactive surfaces. Um, but I want what I want to highlight is that we can also use uh, the fact in both uh, the effect of the electronically switchable diffuser in both directions. We can not only control what goes through in terms of visible light, we can also um, use the clear state of the diffuser to sense objects on top of the on top of the screen. Um, and I, I want to briefly talk about some of the uh, interactions that we've developed using this platform. Um, so earlier in this presentation, we've seen how interactive surfaces allow us to directly mani manipulate digital, mani uh, digital information by directly touching it. Uh, and we've already had this discussion whether uh, this is natural interaction or not, but one thing's for sure. Um, these surfaces don't lend themselves especially well for, uh, for manipulation of 3D content because the sensing is 2D only. And now that we have a technology like Second Light, we want to leverage the space above the surface to allow for more intuitive 3D manipulations of digital content. Um, so in a way, we want users, or we want to enable users to seamlessly switch between on-surface and above-the-surface interaction. Um, so this is a very simple example, but uh, hopefully a telling one. So if in the real world I wanted to place one of these two um, spheres into the blue cup rendered in the middle of the, of the screen, that would be very easy. We just pick it up, drop it, done. Um, but if you're only able to push objects from the side, it's actually a very difficult task because we can't control the, the full 3D position of objects. Um, so our aim in this project was to really leverage the space above the surface to do exactly that, to allow users to, to conceptually pick virtual objects off the tabletop surface and then manipulate their, uh, their three-dimensional position and orientation. Um, and we also wanted to make use of traditional tabletops, so we didn't want users to, to have to wear, you know, like 3D displays, goggles, data gloves, and so on. So essentially, we're exploiting uh, the capabilities of second light. Um, so uh, what we did is we augmented the original setup, and in, in this case, we're using two cameras in this setup. Again, the first camera is synchronized to the diffuse state of the switchable diffuser. We're using FTIR to detect um, on-screen touch interaction. And the, ca the second camera is synchronized to the clear phase of the diffuser. So uh, the camera can look straight through the display and image the user's hands above the surface. Um, and we also added additional infrared light, so light sources that illuminate the user's hands through the display. So again, let's have a look at, at the kind of sensor data that we get from this setup. So the first camera is synchronized to the diffuse state, tracks multiple fingertips. And the second camera is uh, actually synchronized to the clear state. And now we can see the user's hand above the table. And what you can also see is that a hand that's very close to the, to the main screen is very, very bright in the image because it's so close to the additional light sources. But as hands travel further away, they grow dimmer and dimmer. And we can use pixel intensity to, to estimate the height above the table. Um, and we're, we're running a very, very simple uh, computer vision algorithm on top of this. So what we're doing is essentially looking for, um, for holes that appear in the otherwise black background. So the white things rendered down there is what the camera sees off the user's hands. And as the user brings his index, and index finger and thumb together, um, there's a hole that appears in the background. And as the, the, the posture is relaxed, the hole disappears. And that's very easy to track and pick up by a computer vision algorithm. Um, so when, when we combine all these little tricks, we can essentially allow users to simply pick objects off the surface, control their position in 3D, 
and then uh, drop them back onto the surface at a different location. Um, so however, if you look at these, these interaction, it still doesn't, you know, doesn't feel quite right because the hand somewhere up here, the graphics are rendered onto the display and uh, there is some kind of, of loss of directness. Um, so this breaks down to a feedback issue, essentially. If you look at this graphic, it becomes clear that we're, that we're, that we're creating a conceptual uh, volume that's underneath the table and we're operating from above the table. Um, and in order to, to compensate for this decoupling, we introduce a shadow-based technique that essentially uses the image that we can capture of the user's hand to generate um, hand shadows or to generate a feedback mechanism that we fuse with, um, so that allows us to fuse real-world objects with objects in the virtual 3D scene. Um, and then if we look at the very same interaction from before, you have a much better idea where the user's hand is in relationship to virtual objects. And this actually feels a little bit more as if you're, as if you're holding the, um, the actual object in your hands. But obviously, um, once, you, once you have this kind of control over objects, you can do a few, um, I wouldn't call them interaction techniques, but there's a few more examples of the capabilities uh, that arise from this technique. Um, so obviously you could do stuff like layering and stacking, so there's maybe a very simple way to quickly um, organize um, documents. Um, but since the technique works with any number of hands, we can do stuff like object handoff in midair, or um, this example gives you hopefully an idea of, of how much control you got in, in depth or in 3D over objects. So here we're steering through a maze in the, the green yellow and red platform amounted at different heights. And finally, again, we can exploit the, the uh, capabilities of a physics solver and interact with non-rigid bodies, for example, stretching cloth or using um, our, our depth-based interaction to, um, to texture other objects in the very simplest of all 3D um, editors. Um, and with that, I want to wrap up um, and I hope that I've given you an overview of uh, the interactive surface research going on within Microsoft Research Cambridge and other labs. Um, and a few examples that I've talked today about um, where a physics-enabled interaction model that allows um, users to interact with wor virtual worlds in, in new and rich ways. And uh, then with our second light prototype, um, I showed how very cheap objects made from diffuse materials like tracing paper can be used to magically reveal hidden data. Um, and it's also possible for, for a camera inside the second light unit to see out into the space. Um, and this lets us um, use gestures um, performed above the surface to interact with virtual 3D scenes. Um, and in the future, we potentially use this technology, for example, to see how many people um, are standing around and display potentially different graphics to them um, and potentially even detect who they are using face recognition and similar techniques. And with that, I'd like to, uh, to wrap up and thank you for your attention. Well, I don't, I don't know, are there any questions? I, d I don't know what the... Do we have a microphone? Hi. Nice talk, very, very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. And I have two questions. Um, the first is uh, maybe mm, clear question. Are Microsoft are planning to release uh, this uh, second light as a Surface 2.0 in the, in the market? And the second is um, about uh, my activity app as a developer, about the Surface SDK. So it, it has uh, released uh, publicly, mm -hmm. uh, like 10 days ago. And um, I would like to know if uh, some of these um, features are be uh, integrated in the future in the Surface uh, public SDK. Very good question, thank you. Um, to answer the first question, um, so we're, yeah, we're Microsoft Research, and um, we don't know what uh, the product divisions um, take on board, but we're actively talking to them. 
Uh, and in the particular case of second light, we're actually uh, in the process of giving second light units out. Um, right now, this is limited to academic institutions, but there is a couple of universities um, that we're working with. Uh, for example, in Barcelona, Sergi Jorda uh, is getting one of the second light units. Um, and there's other uh, academic institutions. So far, I'm not aware of any, um, of any plans to make this a commercial available product. And I guess it's a little bit out there. So we haven't really figured out you know, what, what kind of applications would make sense in a, in a, in a business sense of the word. Um, and then the second question, if you look at the Surface SDK, there's actually a few ideas from the first part of, of this talk already um, integrated into the Surface SDK. So there's notions of, of uh, momentum, there's notions of friction, and so on. Especially, um, I don't know how familiar you are with the SDK, but if you look at the XNA scatter view, there's actually some physics C um, interactions. It's not as radical as our approach, but there's definitely um, ideas that migrate from research into the, the product groups and divisions. Welcome. Any other questions? Over there, can we have a mic? Uh, hi, uh, question is about uh, minimal technical parameters that you would need to have a functional device like that. Uh, for example, what's the minimum infrared resolution that you would need to be able to um, provide such interaction? Uh, another question is how safe is the device? Uh, for example, essentially I'm staring into the infrared projector, right? That's probably a common question for you. Yeah, um, so the first question, um, what the minimum capabilities are. So what we're, we're using infrared LEDs that operate in the near infrared spectrum, so 850 nanometers wavelengths. And we're using pretty much off the shelf um, cameras. They're black and white cameras because um, they're us usually much more sensitive in the near infrared spectrum, which then makes it easier um, for us. So they're uh, relatively high resolution cameras running at 60 FPS. Um, not quite sure if that was your question. <laughs> Apparently not. Yes. Uh, no, the question was fine. Uh, actually, just another comment. Um, as a side effect, you may be able to track the, the to get some information about blood vessels, where the blood vessels are, and therefore the uh, if you pick the right frequency, for example, for the infra infrared emitters, mm -hmm. right? um, have you gone anywhere in that direction with some perhaps secu security application? Uh, we, we have thought about this. Uh, within Microsoft Research Cambridge, we haven't done anything in, in this direction, but I know of a project in, um, at Columbia University in New York, and they're using a Microsoft Surface right now, and they're planning to do a similar application using Second Light, where you can um, uh, uh, put leaves on top of the surface, and then they're looking at the vesselation within the leaves to detect what kind of what kind of leaf it is, and then display information about trees and and so on. Um, so yeah, <laughs> uh, it, people think about it, and it actually has been done. I'd, I'm not quite sure if the cameras that we're using would provide enough resolution to detect human blood vessels and fingers and stuff like that. But if you use higher resolution cameras, you definitely could, yeah. And then the second question was um, eye safety. Eye safety. Uh, <laughs> so I have to be careful what I'm saying here, because uh, uh, um, don't, go, don't go away and sue Microsoft, please. Um, but we are doing, I, uh, we're doing safety tests, and we had the entire second light rig tested for eye safety and other things. Otherwise, it would just be a, a liability issue if we gave them out to other academic institutions. Um, Surprisingly, there's actually very little work on uh, what eye safety in terms of infrared illumination, illumination actually means. Um, but we had external experts look at the second light unit before we started giving it out to other institutions. There's one more question here.
Microphone not working. Hi. Hi. Uh, there is two questions. Uh, the first uh, is uh, about uh, is full development or is it uh, developing now? Is finished? Not. And the second, uh, what is the background running uh, operating system? Uh, the second one is easy. This is this is still running Microsoft Vista under the hood and. Um, the the applications that you've seen are developed in a vari variety of, of using a variety of technologies. Most of the demos using the the magic lenses and stuff like that are WPF applications, and so we're we're running one full screen projecting onto the diffuse state, and we're running another WPF application running full screen on a second head, right on a second projector, and then the 3D stuff all um, X and A. And uh, there's a lot of custom shaders that are going on, both on the sensing side as well as on the on the rendering side of things. Um, and then the first question was, are we still developing this, right? Um, yes, we are. We are. Uh, I mean, Second Light has happened, or we started working on Second Light, I think, in 2008, two years ago. Um, and it's been published in academic conferences, but we're actively developing it both uh, in the in the sense that I mentioned earlier that we want to give this out and see what other academics come up with, what they do once they have the platform available like this. And we're also in-house thinking of other application scenarios of Second Light. So there is still, yeah, this is still actively under development. And another one, why not Windows 7? <laughs> because Windows 7 wasn't available in 2008. <laughs> That's why. But I'm pretty sure there is support. There is support. Um, um, and as far as I know, for the original Second Light demo, we were using cameras that, at the time when Windows 7 was released, didn't ship with Windows 7 drivers. So we will possibly just have to go back and see if the drivers are now available. But there's no, no reason from our side not to use Windows 7. Just a couple of questions about the physics system and the feedback. Have you experimented with uh, providing feedback when pinching an object and elevating it, like making it bigger, or with heavy objects that takes more height to elevate? Um, yes, actually. I'm not sure if I have a slide. No, unfortunately, I don't. But um, yeah, we have played around with various ways to, to provide this visual feedback. Um, size is one of them. Uh, it didn't work so well. We actually ex ran, like, actual user studies with this. Um, size doesn't work so well because the, the projection screen is relatively small. So if you lift objects off the surface, they soon fill the, fill the entire screen. We have played around, and this is, I think, more promising, with changing the render style. So as you lift objects off the surface, they can dissolve or turn into a wi wireframe object or glow or... And we have played around with different uh, different things to do this. Um, I should have brought like a little video of it because um, it's harder to explain if you can't see it. But we, yeah, we thought about it. Anyone else? More questions? All right, and thank you very much. <laughs>